Who are right over with AMC. Give him a round of applause. Hey everybody, once this gets set up, I'm actually going to stand on the other side of the screen because I'm hoping you'll find the content of the slides a lot more interesting than me. <laughs> um, I think the information is really what's most important. So to start out, I'm a consumer. I have no financial involvement in this industry at all. And I think there's a really powerful message um, in, in how AIMSA got started. Because at the time, Link Williams, who is now the executive vice president of Nick Vape, at the time he was a consumer and had no financial interest in the industry. So it's, it's really amazing what someone can do or people can do if they put their minds together. And we have um, a bunch of members, which obviously was a, an, enabled AIMSA to get started. So AIMSA is the American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association. Um, and it is exactly what it says. We don't sell anything. We are advocates. We put together standards. So let's see, is this gonna work from here? Let's see, about AIM, so let's see. So this is just a little background of where we are today. We've got 26 general manufacturing members. Actually, this is not quite right. I think it's 27 or 28 now, and we've got more than 20 certified uh, members. And you can see all of our standards and information on our website, which is just aemsa.org. We have four subject matter experts. Our newest one is Dr. Richard Sotera uh, from Instant GMP. We're moving our standards forward and trying to develop industry-specific good manufacturing practices. We have four consumer advocates, having consumer involved in an organization. You gotta have the consumer voice. It just doesn't give you the same credibility if it's just people that are in business, talking business. So our, um, we advocate for good manufacturing practices. There are no industry-specific good manufacturing practices yet but our, our standards are a good step in that direction. True GMPs actually have quite a bit more documentation and that's the primary difference between where we are today and having real, uh, real GMPs. The GMP is actually a, a term, a word of art, it's a terminology for specific designation. We launched in October 2012, two years ago, um, and as you already know, Link and I co-found it. AIMSA is a non-profit non professional trade association 501c6. The six is important because it allows us to advocate. And we've been active in the industry, FDA sessions. We've met with the FDA four times. Um, we're trying to get another appointment. We've met with OMB OIRA, it's a division of the White House. Um, we've uh, met, we've, we, get, we speak at TMA. GFN was the Global Nicotine Forum in Warsaw, Poland was the Science Forum. They asked me to fly over there in June and give a presentation. Uh, met, we've met with congressmen on various occasions in DC. Next, there we go. So we started AIMSA with the five core beliefs that we have the responsibility to verify accuracy of all nicotine content, highest quality available ingredients, manufacture the products in a clean, sanitary, and safe environment, and the products are packaged and delivered in a safe manner and provide a level of transparency into the monitoring and verification process. So to get into these a little bit more detail, the accuracy of the nicotine uh, content, we found that certificate of analysis uh, conforming to the standards, basically the, the quality, uh, well, this is accuracy. So what we do is we, we have our members titrate at various stages. So if we have a member that's bringing in working level, say of 100 milligrams, more often than not, that's what's called a target level. And it may or may not be accurate. It could be one batch could come in at 107. Another batch could be 94. And if you don't titrate it and know what you're working with before you start measuring it, you're not gonna have consistency with the accuracy in the final product. And of course, there's random final product testing. Um, and third-party verifications using certified labs. Um, highest quality, we, use, you, we require that our members use USP certified VG and PG through the entire chain of custody. As Michael said to you before, once you crack that seal on USP certified, it's no longer USP certified because it's been exposed to something. One of the things that I look for when I do inspections on members' labs, I don't want to see cardboard anywhere near the lab. Cardboard dust and PG can create what's called diethylene glycol, which is a poison. I don't know if any of you saw the, the back a few years ago, there was a Tylenol, had to close down their children's Tylenol manufacturing because of this exact problem. So anybody that's involved with e-liquid manufacturing, I would encourage you, keep your cardboard away from your PG. 
um, certificate of analysis on the quality of the nicotine. All of our members, every single batch, they have to have a certificate of analysis, which effectively equates to a GCMS. A, 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 it, it's an analysis that shows exactly the, the impurities and the purity of the nicotine. And you can see the standards on the AIMSA website that show we basically dictate farmer grade nicotine. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, third party testing again with evidentiary documentation. Um, the clean, sanitary, and safe environment. Um, a lot of that has to do with the laboratories. I'm not going to get into the stuff you already heard from Michael today about ISO labs. Um, that's kind of a it's an interesting issue. It's got a lot of different sides to it. I applaud Isolabs. I think Isolabs is best for the consumer. I think it's best for the manufacturer. In advocacy, one of the issues that we have to pay attention to is that in, cons in consumable manufacturing, I'm not aware of any consumables that require in their structure Isolabs <laughs> other than pharmaceuticals. And we're not looking for pharmaceutical regulation. So it, 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 it starts to cross the line. It's an interesting subject. Um, the, we have scheduled inspections. We, we go and visit every single lab to make sure that all of the standards are applied. We do it scheduled and unscheduled surprise inspections. We do evidentiary documentation checks. We may just buy a bottle, look at the batch number, call the member up and say, show us the evidentiary documentation on the source nicotine that went into this bottle. Show us your titrations. Um, you know, we want to be able to see all of that. We can actually even do inspections with video conferencing now, but we do put feet on the ground in every single store, every single lab rather. Um, packaging, this gets into things like childproof caps, tamper evidence, smear proof labels, making sure the right information is on the labels. Again, all this information is on our website. Um, again, the random inspections and the secret shopper program. Basically, we'll just randomly go buy a bottle of somebody's product. They won't know who's buying it, and we'll send it off to the lab and have it tested. Um, transparency into the monitoring and verification process. The members agree to give us unfettered access. We have regular reviews. Um, and if you look at our standards, you'll see that there are certain questions and exposures, uh, uh, um, answers that, that our members agree to address even to the consumers, as well as providing evidentiary documentation. So some of the baselines that we found that we advocate for in regulation is we found there's certain things that we know for a fact after two years of doing this that we've established are tried and true and proven. The quality of the nicotine can be verified based on our standards or farmer grade nicotine standards, evidentiary documentation at a batch level. The Lumens VG and PG USB certified through the entire chain of custody. That means if you're buying a working level nicotine at 100 milligrams, you have to have certificate from your supplier that brought in that pure nicotine and knocked it down to the 100 showing that they used USP certified VG and PG in their chain of custody. Now you're probably not going to see their facilities the way Michael shared his with you. Um, what Michael addressed is really a very valid point. Our members also have to show that they are buying USP certified. We do not require ISO. Many of our members do. There are members, we have AIMSA, Michael's here, uh, we have Dan from Mr. E-Liquid is here, uh, several of our other members, uh, Nick Vape and Nickwid, and several of our members are running ISO quality labs. It's not an AIMSA requirement, but keeping that VG and PG clean, um, is, it's important. And, and that certification has to do with how it's bottled, how it's packaged, the environments that it's being exposed to. Again, we talked about titration at the working level. We can verify the final content accuracy, and we use plus or minus 10%, which is what um, NRTs use, and that's where we got it from. Labeling standards, we already talked about. Childproof caps, we've already talked about. But these are baseline standards, and the things that we have on our AIMSA standards are proven to be consistent with what the FDA is probably going to require. So um, some of the things about flavoring testing recommendations. We're starting to hear a lot of talk about diacetyl and acetylpropanol are the two that are of most concern, obviously, right now. Um, it's not, there's no, there isn't a clear solution. Obviously, we're, we're looking to find ways to, to get it out of the supply chain. But flavors are manufactured, for the most part, for food. And di diacetyl and acetylpropanol are not a problem for ingestion via digestion. But lung inhalation, there's a proven concern for these. And there are ways to get rid of it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, using accredited labs. Oops, I didn't mean to click that. 
using accredited labs, what you're looking for is not just standard chemistry. You want to be able to speak to your lab and make sure that they have a very low limit of detection. We're pushing for as low as one part per million or one UG limit of detection. Um, Dr. Farsalinos, who's one of our subject matter experts, has talked about as low as five. We try to go lower if we can. If we can get rid of it, it's, it's flate rings are, are a complex combination of different molecules. So it's a recipe. And if you don't have to put it in there, why put it in there? If we can find a way to get rid of it. So we, we're just starting to see focus from certain people on industry specific supply chains. We believe that if the consumers and the vendors and the e-liquid manufacturers put enough pressure on the primary flavoring suppliers themselves, we can, might be able to get them to start batch testing and posting, and that takes the liability off of them. We're seeing that a lot of them are saying, well, our flavoring is manufactured, is, is for food. We never said it was for vaping and inhalation. But meanwhile, they're enjoying millions and millions of dollars worth of business that they're getting by selling it to this industry, but they don't want to take responsibility. What they need to realize is they could probably, and I'm not a lawyer, but they could probably get themselves out of the liability loop if they would just batch test for low limits of detection and post the results. If they do it once, it's easy, the cost is easily absorbed on a per milliliter basis and the market could easily absorb it. But if they don't do it, if every one of the two or 3,000 e-liquid manufacturers that we have in this country have to go and batch test that exact same batch of flavoring, every single batch, the market cannot absorb that. So one way we can do is start putting a lot of pressure on the flavoring suppliers to start batch testing and posting, and then it's on the e-liquid manufacturer to decide which flavors they're gonna buy and which ones they're not based on the results. Um, random final product testing. I personally, I DIY, and we have a relationship with Enthalie Analytical, but I pulled $500 out of my pocket to have my current four flavors that I'm vaping right now, and I sent off the samples to find out, because I make complex flavors. I have five or six flavors that go into each one of my liquids, and I sent them off to Enthalpy and paid the 500 bucks to have them all tested. And mine came out at two, two parts per million, so <laughs> that's, that's pretty damn low. I was pretty pleased with it. Um, but it, it, it has to happen. I mean, if you really want to be, we're talking about potential product liability here. If we're dealing with a known adulterant that can be eliminated and we're not eliminating it, God forbid something happens. I mean, the, so far nobody's gotten sick from vaping. <laughs> and, and that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. But when someone, if someone does, then we're going to have a problem. And the question is who's going to be on the hook for it? And if you're in this business, you can either be doing it responsibly and doing it right, or you can be saying, you know what, I don't want to incur that expense, I don't want to deal with that. We'll see what happens if and when the court case ever happens. Traceability and transparency, keeping track record of what you're testing, which batches, evidentiary documentation, good record keeping. Um, and we already talked about transforming the supply chain, and there are some industry specific suppliers that are starting to focus specifically on manufacturing flavors for this industry and testing and giving the results all to try to make sure that we don't have any known risk adulterants in the flavoring. So some of the things that the industry can do now going forward. This is one of the things we talk about. Well, regulation's coming and oh, it's two years down the road or three years down the road and then there's a two year grace period and, and there's a lot of question as to what can be going on now. I'm not gonna get into state level advocacy, federal level advocacy. I do a lot of federal level advocacy. That gets into a lot of other things, but the things that the industry can do would be doing for itself to become more responsible right now. So we'll go through some of these. Mainstream media propaganda and rhetoric. How do we bring truth and verification into the public awareness, updating more realistic market size, putting concerns, secondhand exposures, gateway issues, ingestion issues, osmosis absorption, youth rates versus experimentation into more realistic perspective in the public eye. The industry can start focusing on reaching the media and saying, showing how the, this, what's circulating in mainstream media is rhetoric and propaganda. It is not science-based, it is not factual, There's, it's unsubstantiated. We have enough evidence and enough information to show that there is studies in this direction and the industry needs to support more studies in this direction. But we need to find some way to get past what I call the great wall of mainstream media. E-liquid flavoring names versus actual flavors. Do we really need to be using e-liquid variety names that draw attention and criticism and support claims from the industry's marketing to children and youth? Can, if we can change the names, will it reduce the criticisms? 
We're naming these. These are choices that we're making as an industry. Every e-liquid manufacturer, every vendor is putting their labels on the bottle. They're choosing their names. Do we really need to be calling juice Cocoa Puffs or Lucky Charms you know, or S'mores? I mean, names that are easily attra attackable. We can come up with more creative names, find different ways to market the product without doing stuff that is so easily subjecting us to this criticism. And we know it's there. We can fix it. It's something we can do right now. Further steps to counter criticisms. What can the industry do to address, preclude, and or respond to claimed concerns, whether they be real or perceived? Now we're going back up to number one again. Those are some of the concerns that we're seeing in the news, but what can the industry itself be doing now to start addressing some of those concerns in the way we conduct business, in the way we market our product and show what we do? We can start addressing some of this stuff if we together as an industry start focusing on it and start paying, say, putting our heads together and saying, how can we uh, get away from these kind of criticisms and bring truth to, to the, the, the issue? I mean, that's really what it's about is getting the truth out there. Economic, so some of the advocacy steps, some of the things that people were talking about before. What can you say when you go deal with state level, federal level? You have to kind of focus. This gets very complicated because each politician has their own agenda and they have their own concerns based on what's going on in their particular constituency. But some of the things we can focus on, economic impacts. For example, when I went to OMB OIRA, I took a random sampling of our membership and I got answers from about half of them and it was clearly representative of half, both in size distribution. And I was able to show them that based on the growth rate year over year, we're probably representing right now, from our 26 members, we're probably representing around $125 million a year in gross sales. I mean, that's gross sales. But that's a, you're talking about from, from 27 manufacturers. So the economic impacts are really very far reaching. And it's not just in terms of sales, but where all that money circulates through the economy. There are many manufacturers now, you were hearing from the gentleman speaking just before me at Congregate that's selling internationally. Several of our members are shipping internationally. So now we are creating domestic manufacturing in the United States and we're exporting product. For the most part, the United States is importing. So you know, we're, we're sending all of our money out of the country. We can start bringing some of that back if we start exporting as we be, we're an industrial country. That's how we got to where we are. And now we're becoming more of a service-based economy. Here's a product that is helping people get off cigarettes. It's harm reduction and it's an export and it's circulating money through various facets of the economy. So economic impacts, bring some truth to the reality, updating market size estimations. We've been seeing all these quotes that say $2 billion, but that's based on trackable information, mostly the Sigalikes, the convenience stores. That's not the industry, the refillable stuff that we're here at the expo for. We have in, in, in implications that the refillable industry may have already meet or met or exceeds um, the single-like industry in the United States. We believe that the refillable industry is already over $2 billion a year in the U.S. Um, consumers, product-specific vendors, manufacturers, these are just, these are things, these, these categories, I don't have to go through everyone, job creations, domestic manufacturing, importation, exportation. If we start trying to find ways to deal with getting these numbers more accurate, then that can facilitate the advocacy. Some more things that we can do. I'm gonna go through some of these a little bit more quickly because I don't wanna run on all day. Um, advancing activated ver verifications. We know that if, this, if refillables are left on the table, we're gonna have to have active age verification. Ideology is one company that's doing fairly well, but it needs more vendors and more people to get involved and help them to refine that system so that it's accurate, consistent, and easily usable. What can the industry do to discourage youth experimentation? Again, things that the industry itself can be focusing on and trying to collectively bring our, our minds together. How can we start discouraging youth experimentation? Responding to and are publicly illuminating bad science. We see it all the time. We see suppositions, speculations. We see science that's manipulated. The survey done by the CDC was a twist of the actual facts that came out of that survey when my, Dr. Michael Siegel looked at it and represented it in a head-to-head -head at the TMA <clears throat> against Tim McAfee, who was the, <coughs> excuse me, I think the number two person at the CDC. He basically flipped the, the exact statistics and just represented them differently and showed that the real increase year over year was only amongst those people who were already smoking. 
that the non-smoker experimentation, it was really only ever try, it wasn't really users, and the way they identified users, if a person in a survey said, well, I might consider trying it at some point, they lumped them together with someone who was using the product, even though they weren't using the product. So we've seen a lot of, of questions about Stan Glantz's science that seems to go in direct contradiction to so many other scientists that are peer-reviewed and published. And we need to find ways to let regulators and the public know that what they're seeing in the media is only one side of the picture. We have real science. We need to start bringing those science references to the public and finding breaking past the mainstream media. But again, these are things that we can focus on right now. This is all stuff that's here today, real, right now. Educating anti-smoking zealots. Is it possible to open minds? Has anybody tried? You know, AIMSA can't do it all, but with, with 15,000 potential vendors in the United States, we've got an awful lot of creativity and a lot of minds. We could be focusing on this if people start thinking about it and trying to find a way to deal with it. We've already heard from Vaping Militia and some of the other people about state lobbying and federal lobbying. Um, inspiring consumer and constituent voice to regulator, regulators. I was talking about that earlier when I was answering a question for, for Joe from Vaping Militia. The industry, you can be encouraging your consumers to get involved and let their voices be heard. Constituents are votes. It's an election year. Next year's an election year. We can get, a, we've got a big consumer base. If we've got a $2 billion market in the U.S., that's an awful lot of consumers. That's an awful lot of votes and constituents. We could be influencing it if we're working together, trying to find ways to make it happen. And getting more vendors active at government levels, that's what I was saying before. When we see these various advocacy efforts, we're not seeing a lot of vendors actually showing up at the table. You gotta show up. You gotta be in it to win it. You gotta go and speak your voice. You gotta speak professionally. You can't be vaping during hearing. You gotta dress the part, be the part, act the part, and there's enough people around that will help you get there if you speak up and get involved. So the evolution of the next five years. Um, so you've got matured manufacturing is going to basically be involving all these various components. We've got industry-defined GMPs, we already talked about that. Creation of industry-specific supply chains, we've already talked about that in relation to flavorings. Vertical integration, what is vertical integration? Vertical integration means bringing all the pieces of a manufacturing process together in one entity. Now, this industry is completely non-vertical. <laughs> Everything is coming from different places, from outside the country, inside the country, hardware manufacturers, batteries, atomizers, wire, liquids, supply the different components of liquids. What the government is going to look for is how they're going to be able to minimize the exposure. They look at a company like Big Tobacco. Big Tobacco is vertically integrated. They're growing the, the tobacco plants. Every single part of it is all within one company or closely controlled within one company. That's what they're going to look for ultimately in regulations out of this industry is they're going to look to find ways to narrow, to funnel down the variables into a more uh, approachable or controllable or overseeable industry. Right now everything is completely spread out and nobody's looking at vertical integration, but it's going to happen. Someone's going to get involved and start to bring the pieces together within one house. And that's something I anticipate is going to happen over the next five years. Regulation integration, FDA, EPA, customs. FDA we know is looking at regulations for the product in terms of what can be sold, how it will be manufactured. EPA, what do you do with your nicotine bottles? If you're manufacturing liquid, you've got nicotine. What do you do with that bottle when that bottle's empty? It's still got nicotine in it. It's still considered toxic. It has to be dealt with. That's where the EPA comes in. Customs, you're importing product. We've already seen issues that come up with that. Um, product profiling, that gets a little bit complicated, but we've got different consumer bases out there. Um, Sigalikes tend to be the transitional product. Then we've got products that are for the everyday vapor, the clear misers, the ego batteries. Then we've got the, um, the, the enthusiast equipment where you start getting into mechanicals and rebuildable atomizers and things like that. And then we've got regulatory categories where they treat cigars or premium cigars differently than they do from other tobacco products. Because that has a different product profile, it only speaks to specific segments of the tobacco market. So we're going to start seeing more of that happening. Advanced testing, international standards, things we've already talked about. Engineering flavoring, something we've already talked about. Innovation of the user experience, that comes back to product profiling to some extent. But we're getting into seeing in devices, short circuit protections, um, undercharge, overcharge, smart charge, 
things of this nature, things to protect the battery, things to protect the consumer, and dealing with, with, with different types of tanks. Some of them leak, some of them don't leak. Dealing with some of those issues, some of the, the, the various ways to make it easier and easier for the consumer and safer and safer to get away from some of these big public scary concerns. Oh my God, a touch of, you know, when we saw the, the, the Senator Boxer and she was afraid to pick up a bottle. Oh my God, this is toxic. I mean, if I had been in that room, I would have gotten up and poured it in my hands and washed my hands together and gargled with some of it to show her how ridiculous she was being. But, you know, it is what it is. Market intelligence, we need to understand the overall market. We can't just focus on one little aspect. As an industry, we need to start understanding the market, what's happening in the market, why some of these transitions. We saw mechanicals come up, and then we saw a big shift towards electronics. Now we're seeing enthusiasts move back towards mechanicals, and there's issues in the mechanicals we just don't know. If we hit certain temperatures, <clears throat> What's happening with these ingredients at certain temperatures? Is there potential amperage feedback back into a battery? If you're not using the right battery, could you potentially be making that battery volatile? There are a variety of different issues in here that we just don't understand as an industry well enough, and we need to be focusing on research, and we need to be focusing on educating ourselves so that when we go and speak to regulators and we speak to consumers, we can be educating people accurately and appropriately. Um, and we already talked about industry define GMPs. Where's the next slide? Okay, so research, coming back to research. I'm a big proponent of research because research is ammunition. If it's peer reviewed, if it's published, if it's factual, it's ammunition. And right now that's one of the things we need the most. We need verifiable ammunition. It's got to be published so that it's publicly available. It's got to be scrutinized by the professional medical and scientific community so that it's not just supposition. <clears throat> we can't be criticized of buying our research. It's got to stand up to the scrutiny of the professional community. So industry must come together to fund research. I'm not going to say much more about this today, but keep your eyes open. Something's coming. Um, and it's good. Get behind it. Publicly funded research has been historically very, very slow. The FDA is saying they're going to put $270 million over the next five years into research in this industry, but we may not see that results until 2018. Meanwhile, they're working on regulations right now that are coming out in the next year or two. So we have got to get the industry to start really stepping up and funding the research so that we have the facts. Because if we don't have the facts, we have no argument and we're not going to be able to stand toe to toe with anybody that's saying it's this, it's that, it's the other thing. Even if they don't have proof, we don't have proof in the opposite direction. We've got to have research and we've got to fund it and research is not cheap. So right now this industry is enjoying ridiculously high profit margins because there's no regulatory cost component. There's no commercial manufactured consumables in this country that do not have a regulatory cost component. And so these profit margins are not going to stay. Even if this industry stays alive with refillables at the end of the day, there's going to be a regulatory cost component. So we might as well start focusing on it right now and putting that cost component that's not going into regulation into research so that we can impact the regulation, at least have good solid arguments and be able to educate ourselves and educate consumers. Um, all research that we said peer reviewed and published and representative of all industry segments, including public policy and consumers. Again, I'll just leave this. Keep your eyes peeled. It's coming. Okay, so just to wrap things up, we still have millions of annual tobacco related deaths globally and yet there is so much effort to eliminate the first real effective harm reduction product to come along. What does it say about our society and government when it takes an official act of Congress to be able to embrace verified harm reduction under reasonable, realistic, and sustainable regulations. <clears throat> That's where we're at. Because the FDA only can, doesn't make regulation, rule, doesn't make the law, they only make rules within the existing law. And so the reason that these products are going to be regulated as tobacco products is because there, it takes an act of Congress to write a new law to regulate them differently. And the only reason the FDA can regulate them is because they have nicotine, which under the definition of the Tobacco Control Act, anything that's derived from nicotine. So the FDA is going to have a real hard problem on their hands because now we're seeing a huge increase in the zero nicotine vaping market segment. And that has no nicotine in it. So how do they regulate a PV device that has not been used for nicotine? 
You have one here, it's being used for nicotine. You have the same one here that is. You got a liquid that's got zero nicotine. Can the FDA regulate that as a tobacco product? Not based on their own definition of a tobacco product, they can't. So we've got an act of Congress. That's what it's going to take to make reasonable, realistic. The modified risk tobacco, modified risk, MRTP, modified risk tobacco product category of the, T, the Tobacco Control Act is so tight, not a single product has passed it. Not one. It's easier to get a new deadly known tobacco product approved today than it is to get a modified risk tobacco product. So how crazy is that? How would we have a modified risk tobacco product that is so stringent that not a single product, does that incentivize tobacco harm reduction? No, it prohibits it and inhibits it. If the same extensive resources that are being applied to blocking and banning these products were instead applied to making sure these products were ever safer, truthfully and accurately educating the public and irresponsible parents, etc., we see tobacco harms drop faster than ever before in history. How many of you have actually seen these reports in the news that, oh my God, there's all these new poison control calls because of children being exposed to nicotine from e-liquid bottles? You've all seen them, right? Are those parents letting those same three-year-old, four-year-olds play with sharp knives? Are those same parents letting those little kids play with Clorox or alcohol or kerosene? No. So we've got parents out there that are basically leaving this stuff within reach. Would they leave a bottle of uh, super glue? No. So we've got, we, you know, we've got some education. Some of the responsibility is on us for some of this stuff. And that's pretty much it. I will... Uh, Go on, I think that's the last slide. So there's our website, Link Williams, myself, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to field them. Anybody? Right, guys. Well, it looks like in about two and a half hours, you got crammed with a lot of information. Was it pretty good? Yeah? Yeah. Awesome.